Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of our Steamy Summer Podcast Series, presented by Osmo Education, where we're having an opportunity to chat with a bunch of great educators about all the various things they're doing in their classrooms to promote STEM and STEAM education and student engagement, differentiation, and so much else. So today we are uh, pleased to really be joined by Micah Brown. And Micah is a technology and innovation lead teacher in Andover, Kansas. She's also an Osmo ambassador, as all of our guests are. And she is one of the founders of the Awesome Squiggles Global Art Challenge. So Micah, thanks so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. And so uh, in this case, we're really excited. Uh, I'm excited to get the chance to talk about that A in STEAM, that arts piece. And you know why is it so important in your mind? You do a lot of work in this area for STEM to be STEAM. Why why are the arts essential to get in there? Absolutely, I think that art is basically the connecting piece. It's kind of the common thread that everyone can experience. Um, with art, there aren't any limits, no real language barriers that can connect us all on an emotional level. I mean, this has been a really hard year. When we experience emotions like sadness and anxiety, research suggests that expressing them through visual and performing arts is one of the most effective ways to address them. I think that's part of the reason art is such a vital part of STEAM. You know, at, at the core of art is creativity. If you truly look at the other words in the acronym of STEAM, you will notice that creativity is kind of a core part of all of them. We can't have the scientific method without being creative. We can't do technology and coding without being creative. And so I believe that art fits right in there. And one of the other, you know, speaking of acronyms, we have STEM, we have STEAM, and and one of the others that's come up so much in recent conversations, uh, especially after this long pandemic, is SEL, <laughs> social emotional learning, and really understanding and tuning into and supporting students' well-rounded needs. And I know the you know the arts can be a really powerful tool uh, in that regard to really have students just being able to express right and express and explore different parts of themselves that don't naturally manifest in other subject matter, but where the arts can really bring that out. And so that can be a big thing too. And I don't know if that's something that, that you've experienced as well. Absolutely. And sometimes when we do art and we think about technology and things, people are often afraid of what we call screen time. And we need to know that technology isn't the inspiration. It's just a tool that allows kids to express themselves creatively, uh, creatively, sorry, and show what they know. I recently read something on Common Sense Media about um, calling out what we're really doing with technology with kids going from you know the consumers to cr to creators if if they are creating on there call it that if they're exploring calling it exploration time really getting kids away from that sit and get that uh consuming and so as i mentioned in the intro your uh, commitment to art has been such that you've gone as far as to co-found the awesome squiggles challenge tell us about that who can participate what's it all about sure everyone can basically participate. We do it in the spring every year. Part of my job as a technology and innovation lead teacher is to help set up just different learning opportunities to empower students and teachers. Like I mentioned earlier, it's not about how um, to use the actual technology. It's about how we use the technology to en enhance kids' learning experiences. And like you mentioned, I, I do that by helping coordinate global collaboration projects like Awesome Squiggles. It's a project that was created um, with my dear teacher friends back in 2015. Her name is Diane. And Smokorowski. And basically pre-K through 12th grade learners around the world, we even had some a, a student teachers join us this year at the collegiate level, create original art based on just four squiggle lines, and then they share artwork with others. So we change the lines every year. And this is really where the power of integration comes in. Art is the connector as we empower students. Um, we encourage them to integrate writing and, and writing about their, their squiggles and storytelling. And then they also have an authentic opportunity to practice their listening and speaking skills in a collaborative format as they share with other classrooms around the world. Yeah, and I, I think that you, know, you touched on uh, there's some sort of uh, cross-curricular or you know integration of different skills that come in there. Certainly uh, creativity and collaboration are two of the really highlighted skills that, that you're really promoting through the challenge. And if we drill down on those skills a little bit more, I mean, why are they so important in the arts? Uh, obviously creativity, I think most people will understand that, but the collaboration piece, I think a lot of times you don't necessarily perceive art as being as collaborative. Sometimes it's thought of as there's an artist over there doing, you know, doing their project, but that collaboration piece can be so powerful. Why, why are those so big in the arts and also in other 
academic subjects as well. Absolutely. I'll speak to the academic subjects for sure. Um, I come from little people world. And so my primary area is pre-K through fifth. And often collaboration is thought of, okay, you just get in a group and you do it. And um, some of that needs to be explicitly taught and explicitly given to kids as an opportunity to do. Um, like we talked about creativity and art being strung throughout all of STEAM. So is collaboration. We know that the more brains, the better. And as we have kids, um, work on their ORC skills and um, working together, we know that better things can happen. But innately, kids don't necessarily know how to do that. And so when we set up experiences to collaborate on not only a global scale, but with even within their own classroom with their peers, um, we know that that is to their benefit. And as they get more natural with how they communicate and they can collaborate to um, a better extent. And I know in the Awesome Squiggles Challenge that uh, one tool that you uh, that you've used and encouraged uh, participants to use is Osmo Masterpiece. Uh, why is that tool so great for this type of a, a challenge? Yeah, it's awesome. I love um, Osmo Masterpiece um, because it hits on two different levels. It, it hits on that individual level where I can be creative on my own, but then it hits a collaborative level as well. It's um, a drawing tool that can be used can, across multiple content areas. Students can draw anything they can imagine. So in the awesome squiggles, we start them with the four lines. And so not only can they connect those lines and create different drawings with the Osmo Masterpiece, they can save a time-lapse video of the process to share with an audience. And we know when there's an audience beyond just themselves or the teacher, that student ownership, engagement, and learning of content are increased. So having students use Osmo Masterpiece to showcase their knowledge and to an authentic audience is a great way to empower students and to also teach them how to give their peers meaningful and respectful feedback. We talked about earlier how this is not um, a natural skill for most kids, being able to um, give feedback respectfully. So it also helps um, students go from a consumer to being a creator of that content from which others can learn. And I think that naturally kind of leads to something that I was thinking about, and, and even if we kind of almost zoomed out and then re-zoomed into the classroom environment and thinking about you know, some of the things you're describing about the skills that students are developing and the way they're collaborating and working together. You know, think about your classroom and, and the classroom that you've worked in and tried to foster. What does a thriving classroom environment look like? When, when you know that things are really working the way they're supposed to work, what does that look and feel and sound like? It almost feels surreal <laughs> because, you know, stereotypically you think about um, the teacher being up front and being the giver of uh, information. Um, in a thriving classroom, I believe that it is more symbiotic um, where the teacher is more of the facilitator. And I, I sometimes think that we don't give kids enough opportunity to rise to the occasion. And when you set them up with things like STEAM and these opportunities to be creative, they truly go above and beyond what you can expect. And so um, in a thriving classroom, I believe in that, that collaborative piece and kids being able to not only showcase who they are and how they learn best, but how they can function within a system. And largely, I, it seems in a lot of cases that that environment not the teacher being able to to create and determine the environment they want. I mean, you have that real teacher-led expertise piece, right? And you kind of know what your objectives are and what you're trying to do. And then a lot of times it really comes down to have you found and been able to use the right tools that actually help you find that right balance, that it's not either or, it's not, well, we're using this technology or I'm teaching or it's student led or it's teacher led. It, it's how all these things kind of fit together and how you can kind of tap into the strengths of what you have at your disposal. Um, to say there are certain times when students are learning things that I didn't necessarily teach them, but they learned because they were engaged in some activity and they explored and they learned and then we were able to build on that. And then there's other times, of course, where you have to, uh, you know, what, what the objective is and you have to dictate that. How, how does that kind of work um, for you in, in your experience, like finding that balance or even that process of determining I'm using a particular tool? You know, obviously, we're talking about 
the Osmo learning tools here. It could be anything else though, um, to say, okay, this is accomplishing what I wanted to accomplish. This is helping me with this thing that's really hard to do on my own. And it's helping me to build on that or eh, we're gonna change strategies here. or There's a different way I have to approach that. How do you kind of go about um, figuring out that, that balance? Sure. It's always about the learning. Tech tools come and go. It's about how you leverage the tech to meet the learning goals. And I truly believe that's um, hinged on empowering students, um, letting them know what resources are available to them and what they feel comfortable with. And um, one of the things that my district is focusing on right now are the ISTE student standards. So I, I recently did a workshop where I facilitated about the empowered learning standard. It's really the cornerstone of all of the ISTE student standards. And its whole intention is to have students leverage technology and take the active role in choosing and achieving and demonstrating competency in their learning goals. And so we have a set standard of different tech things that are available to us. And, you know, as educators, we're always looking for things to engage our students. But at the end of the day, a digital worksheet is just a digital worksheet. And right. so you really have to think about what I mentioned earlier. How are you having kids use the technology? Yeah. So when you think about the goals you set for your learners and, mm -hmm. and the goals you personally have as an educator for these are the things I want, you know, maybe it relates to particular of the ISTE standards and some of the things that those are trying to kind of develop and, and maybe it's bigger than that, but what are you know, some of the number one goals that you really set to say, when these students leave my classroom, they go on to the next grade level, mm -hmm. this is what I want for them. In my district, we have something that's called Portrait of a Graduate. And so we have um, a wheel of five things that we really look at when students leave our system, what do we want them to have accomplished? And I think the, the whole heart of it is how they are able to um, see themselves as lifelong learners, being able to go through some productive struggle and come out on the other end. And so creating that safe environment where kids can learn to set goals, to meet goals, to kind of struggle through some things, I think is really healthy. When kids leave my classroom, I want them to have a sense of confidence that they do not know all the answers, but they've been given resources and tools and the confidence that they can lean on peers, that they can lean on different teachers. It goes back to that social emotional piece. I feel safe. I am a lifelong learner. Yeah, no, those are, those are great goals to have in mind. So Micah, we're going to now uh, shift to our final two questions here for having a chance to ask all of the ambassadors as part of this series. And the first one is, as we're here in this steamy, hot summer, and you're thinking about your ways to beat the heat, what is your tip for our listeners to beat the heat this summer? So to beat the heat this summer, I encourage you to find um, a ice cold drink um, of your choosing. Mine is iced coffee. And I like to sit around and we do so much learning during the summer. Take the opportunity to attack that stack of books that maybe have been piling up. Recently, I don't know uh, your part of the country, but our local library has opened back up. And so taking my kiddos back in, you know, for the summer reading challenges and things and um, not only learning for ourselves professionally, but in, enjoy a book um, personally as well. So beat the heat, get in the, a cool area or by the pool or I can't in Kansas, but you know, those ocean people, they can hang out and enjoy a good book either professionally or personally. Right. Well, I am close to the ocean, but I can second your, uh, your recommendation about getting back to the libraries because that's definitely been a, a big um, community hub that's been missing over this pandemic period and great place to check out some new books or just even just uh, get a change of scenery, right? <laughs> a new place to read, work, or, or, uh, or find some new activity. And so our final question here, as we're thinking ahead to next year, and I think we're going to have listeners here who are brand new to Osmo for Schools, others who uh, maybe have been using it in their classroom for some time. But if you had to highlight just uh, your one hot tip that you would give to educators for using Osmo in the classroom next year, what would you say? 
Sure. Before giving out that tip, I do want to throw out there, it is kind of a second tip. Get involved in our community. We have um, Osmo on Facebook for teachers and for parents. Get involved in that. Um, reach out to any of us and we can help as we move forth with what education will look like in the fall. Osmo has so many different opportunities for learners. And what I love about Osmo is that it gets kids out of the screen and they're called tangible play for a reason. And so, um, like I talked about earlier, I think Osmo Master Masterpiece is the easiest step in for teachers to utilize. Um, after a read aloud, I know as we get older and we move out of picture books, kids are um, reading to learn. So have them read perhaps something nonfiction or even a fiction that has no uh, illustrations and encourage them to be the illustrators um, for that uh, piece. And then they can showcase their Osmo time lapse videos to their different um, peers in their classroom. So perhaps I tackle one chapter and the next peer does a different chapter and we have a showcase of our time-lapse videos. Great. Well, Micah Brown, thank you so much for being a part of this episode of our Steamy Summer Series. Listeners, if you're listening on your preferred podcast that maybe Apple, Spotify, Google, or any other app, uh, make sure you head over to schools.playosmo.com to learn a lot more about the various tools and resources available for your classroom. And check out the rest of our series here to hear from a whole variety of great educators. Micah, thanks again for being with us. 